The Tom Woods Show, episode 1165. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. All you crypto folks out there, if you're holding your crypto on a hardware wallet, you need Bill Foddle, which is designed to back up your private key or recovery phrase. Get a special deal just for my listeners at BillFoddle.com slash Woods. That's B-I-L-L-F-O-D-L dot com slash Woods. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Naomi Brockwell is our guest today. And my goodness, is she involved in many, many things. She's a television producer, cryptocurrency expert, On social media, she's got a lot of interesting things happening. She is the narrator of the Bubble films, which were loosely based on my book Meltdown, and uh, you'll see the release on that coming up in July. You can check that out at thebubblefilm.com about the stock market and housing bubbles. And I am delighted to say she will be joining us on this year's Contra Cruise, which is the libertarian event of the year, which you should check out at ContraCruise.com. Naomi, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I guess I'm probably going to meet you in person for the first time. Wait, we haven't met before, have we? We haven't, but I'm sure that we've been at the same libertarian events. Right, exactly. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. I, I was afraid that my, maybe my middle-aged memory was about to betray me there. But you have, um, what is your role with the Soho Forum? So I co-founded the Soho Forum with Gene Epstein. Um, while he was economics editor at Barron's, we uh, actually had an Austrian economics reading group that we'd host in New York. And then uh, Gene is a wonderful moderator. So the two of us set up the Soho Forum. And it's yeah, it's been going really well. He's done an amazing job with that. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful debating society. If you are anywhere near the New York City area, you are in for an amazing treat month after month. I got to go to one of them in, I guess it was April, and just had a tremendous time. And you're going to get to meet and network with a lot of very fine folks in the area. So you definitely want to check that out at thesohoforum.org. And I'm going to be there at the the June event, June 11th, with because um, I'm going to be in New York with one of my, well, I, I, children. Well, she's turning 15, so... I don't know what you say. One of my daughters, anyway, will be there with me. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my gosh, when I look over all the things you do, I hardly know where to start. So let's (laughs) start with, tell me about what Hard Fork is and what makes it unique. Well, Hard Fork is a television series that I'm producing at the moment. It's um, It's been a fascinating project for me because it's a series that is about the blockchain space and we're actually raising all of our capital uh, for cryptocurrencies. So it was, um, it's a sci-fi thriller that's this very gritty uh, feel to it about this totalitarian regime that has, um, the government's become anonymized, they do everything on this centralized blockchain, everything is tracked, you know, health records records and travel and purchases, everything is tracked by the government. And a group of renegades come in and they um, they try to decentralize any, everything. But what's exciting about it, so I actually, uh, I discovered it on Steemit, which is a platform where people can post things and they actually earn revenue by people upvoting their posts. So it's sort of like if you're posting things on Facebook or Reddit, that every time you get a like or an upvote, you get money for it. And I um, I got involved in, in Steam in 2016 and uh, forgot about it. I was like, oh, this is probably play money and pretend money. And I didn't really know what was going on. Then I rediscovered it a year later, got involved, put my first post up. And I got, you know, I got what it said, oh, I've got 30 Steam dollars. And I was thinking, is this real money? Is like, what, what is this? But then I actually transacted out. I exchanged my Steam it for Bitcoin. And at that point, I realized, oh, wow, no, this is actually real money. And so that was really exciting. So I discovered this project, Hard Fork, and we have uh, Doug Carr is our director. He's a Sundance alumni, does some awesome stuff. Uh, Christopher James Baker, he was in Ozark, True Detective, uh, done uh, some amazing uh, TV shows. And uh, they were working with a bunch of really cool people putting together this show. And I discovered it and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm a, I'm a film producer and I'm in love with crypto. And this is a uh, TV series about crypto. I have to become involved. So I, uh, I, I got in touch with them and they were actually in the process of reaching out to me to see if I would, would get on board. So it was just this wonderful um, alignment of, of interests there. And what they were doing 
is creating content, putting it on Steam it. They would get money that they would then reinvest and put back into production and make something else, put it on Steam it. And this was just this iterative process. They ended up raising uh, all of the incubation money for the show through Steam it. So about $30,000, which they then put into making this te- teaser trailer. And they debuted it. We, we debuted it. By that stage, I was on board. Um, we debuted this teaser tra- trailer we made at the Steam Fest, Lisbon uh, Steam Fest last year. It got tremendous response. We got to meet some of the people in the Steam community who'd been on board with uh, with this show and who were creating fan art for us. And uh, it's just such a wonderful community there. And uh, so from there, we actually then put in a proposal to Dash, which is a cryptocurrency that earmarks a certain amount of every coin that is mined, puts it into this pool and people can vote on where those resources go to. So we put in a proposal for the the Hard Fork series. This is a multi-million dollar series that we're putting together. So we put in a proposal to them and uh, it got approved. So we actually raised our first, uh, first million through Dash for the show. So it's been a really exciting process for me to be working with the cryptocurrency community, getting them excited about what will probably be the first mainstream television show based entirely on this world. And, um, and not just making the show about cryptocurrency, but actually working within the space to get it all done. So it's been, it's been a dream project for me. Yeah, absolutely. That's really amazing how that all came together and how it's mutually reinforcing that it's about this kind of world and it's being financed by this kind of world. So once you get a a, a teaser trailer, so-called, is that then another engine that you use for further fundraising? Absolutely. So putting that back into the system, getting more money uh, from that. So every element that we're making uh, by you know piecemeal fundraising, we're then using that element to generate more uh, revenues, put that capital back into our production. So uh, slated to start production the end of this year. That's what we're aiming for at this stage. But it's been such a great process and such a tremendous response from the community that um, is, I mean, it's just firing us along. Like one thing about the film industry is that it generally moves really slowly from, you know, getting grants or raising capital or, uh, you know, working within um, like the establishment in Hollywood, like it just moves so slowly. And so you juxtapose that with the uh, cryptocurrency space, which moves at lightning speed. You can hardly keep up with it. And uh, it's it's the fastest moving film project I have ever been a part of. Um, And it's tremendously exciting for me. And it's tremendously exciting to see this new avenue for uh, capital raising being generated through cryptocurrency. I actually wrote an article for Forbes recently talking about how this is completely going to revolutionize things in in all industries for raising capital, not just the entertainment industry, but as as someone who comes from the entertainment industry. For me, I think it's so important for artists to realize that there are options out there for them. There are um, different ways to raise capital now that have never existed before. So you don't necessarily have to go through traditional means that are very slow moving, very difficult to navigate, they're huge barrier century. It's, uh, it's this democratization of the space that I'm really enjoying being part of at the moment. I want to get back to crypto in a moment, but let's stay on the entertainment line of things. Uh, there's a lot we could say about what Naomi Brockwell does in that respect, but in terms of production, I know you've worked over at Fox on, on Fox News and Fox Business. I know that uh, you're producer for Stossel on Reason. And I'm curious about where, given that you have your hand in so many different projects, you got your start. Uh, So my start was actually just making films with my friends in Australia. So for years, um, I was lucky to to have a lot of talented people around me that I could ride on the coattails of. So we'd, we'd make these fun projects and that's really where it started. But when I moved to America, I moved as an opera singer. And um, found some awesome teachers to work with, decided to stay in America because the training is just second to none uh, in New York here. But the problem is, you know, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm not American. I am a foreigner. So it is remarkably difficult to stay in this country. And um, and 
So what I had to do was you have to find full-time employment to get sponsored and it just doesn't exist in the performance world. So I actually pivoted then, went back to film production, uh, worked on some really, really awesome projects there. And then I started my production company, Rainsworth Productions, set that up, uh, produced a bunch of feature films and sort of, yeah, sort of started from there, taking what was, was just a fun hobby with my friends and then say, well, this is actually something I'm good at and really enjoy. So why not? Uh, why not pivot there and and go full fledged and make this my career? I was in New York a month or so ago, and I actually saw John Stossel come come out of some storefront, and but it was a hugely crowded sidewalk. Hmm. But I just felt like I couldn't let him just go by, so I just <laughs> I just said John Stossel, woohoo! And and then you know he gave the thumbs up and kept walking. And I thought that's that's all I needed to say. I just needed him to know that we knew he was here. I don't need an autograph or anything, but but he's such an interesting guy, given that these days it's a little bit easier to say the sorts of things that he says on the air. But when you're on ABC in the 1980s and you're the only guy saying anything like this, that is, he's a real trailblazer. Even though he might not be, let's say, as hardcore as I am, I respect the heck out of that guy for for the the things he's done. And I remember I've been on, I mean, I've been invited to be on a few times. I accepted once and I went on, it was a very good segment. But before we went on, he hadn't heard me before. And he, all he heard was that I lived in Kansas, which I did at the time. So I think that translated to him as boring. So he said (laughs) off the air, he said, now, listen, I just want you to understand there are many options our viewers have. You know, the next channel over has dancing girls on it. We have to give them a reason not to flip to the dancing girl. So he was basically saying, don't bore them to death. Right. And then I, we had our segment. He said, well, hey, actually, that's pretty good. I guess I didn't have anything to worry about. I looked at your bio. You got to understand. I th- assumed it was going to be, you know, kind of like pulling teeth. So it was kind of fun <laughs> to do that. But what what have your experiences been like, uh, let's say, behind the camera on the production side of programming that is dealing with topics from, you know, a a non-mainstream perspective? Right. I mean, working for John has just been so amazing for me. My learning curve has just went through the through the roof. I um I've learned so much working with him. And that's it. What he drills into you is just keep it interesting. The amount of times where I've given him pieces and said, you know, I feel really good about this. This is awesome. He'll just go through and just cross it all out. He's like, Naomi, you're making me fall asleep here. <laughs> <laughs> do something you can do better than this. Or I'll, you know, I'll go do a, a a trip to Chicago and I'll come back with what I think is great footage. And he's like, Naomi, you're driving around in a truck. Why didn't you interview them in the truck? Like he's just constantly thinking of, you know, good ways to to keep people's attention. And, And I'm really grateful because with my show, the tech show that I do, I mean, it is very dry and jargony and, and I, you know, I always try and keep it interesting. And I've learned a lot from John with that. And sometimes I'll give, uh, give the pieces to John and say, I'd love your feedback. What do you think? And he's just like, Naomi, it's, uh, it's too jargony, you know, it's, uh, it's boring. And he's just constantly pushing me to, to do better. So it's been absolute dream working for him. Um, and, you know, having segments that are, are non-mainstream, I, it's, as you said, it's just so important because you don't see many people doing that. And John's just kept doing it. Uh, it didn't matter, you know, when ABC started to censor him, he just found another way to get his message out there. And I just think that's so admirable to just keep going. And uh, and now, you know, aiming at a younger audience because no one no one my age has cable anymore. We, we don't watch television. So, you know, educating a, a new wave of people about these ideas and uh, getting on the internet, I just think is so important right now. Yeah, very smart. Now you have, as you were saying, you have your own program, a uh, techy and crypto-y program. Uh, tell me about it and uh, what it's called, how long you've been doing it, what people get when they tune in. Well, I started, um, I started making videos about Bitcoin in 2013 and it started off just interviewing my friends in the space and I had started working at the New York Bitcoin Center then. And so I'd, I'd get to interview guests who came through. And the main idea was, I mean, at that time, no one had heard of Bitcoin. I, I felt like I was late to the scene because everyone had been involved for you know years at that stage. The first Bitcoin transaction happened in, in 2010, like the real world exchange of Bitcoin for, for actual 
all good. So I felt like I was late to the scene, but honestly, at that stage, no one had heard of it. So my aim with the show was just to educate people and uh, do it from a non-technical perspective. It's uh, It was really difficult, and I think it is still difficult for people to wrap their head around what cryptocurrency is, why it's important if they don't come from a techie background. And there are so many amazing people who are super smart in the industry who just don't know how to communicate to people who don't have a math degree. And so the aim was really to see if I could provide a bridge between those two audiences. Say, this is important for someone who cares about freedom or you know, autonomy or uh, the right to financial privacy and you should learn about this. But you know, I'm not going to try and explain what a hash function is to you. I'm just going to explain why it's important and uh, and why you should be taking note of it. So that's how it all started. And from there, I um, I just kind of uh, slowly grown it over the years. I've been working full time producing other things. And then this year is the first time that I've actually been focusing full time on building the show out. So that's been really fun to, to be focusing on that now. And um and it's, it's nice having been in the industry for such a long time to have access to some of the, the most amazing people who really are just creating this cutting edge tech who, who, who are changing all of our lives. And we don't even realize it. You know, the amount of, of privacy and freedom that they're giving back to us and we don't even realize that that they're doing it. Um, it's just amazing to chat to these people, find out what they're doing and, um, and find out what makes them tick and, and spread that message to my viewers. So I've, I've had such a great time building out my show. Well, I'm glad to hear you describe it that way because I think the major issue with Bitcoin in terms of getting it accepted and getting it more mainstream attention, apart from the occasional skyrocketing of the price, is the the, the problem. I mean, that's that gets a lot of attention. Right. But the, the the thing that seems to me to be blocking it is bad promotion of it because there's yeah. a difference between being an engineer and being a marketer. And sometimes when we're brilliant at one thing, we assume we're brilliant at everything. And some of my most important advances as a person have come when I've realized I stink at some things. <laughs> and so we have these incredible Bitcoin developers who have genius IQs. And then they're the ones on the videos trying to explain Bitcoin to people. And it's a horror because they're already off in techie land by sentence number one and a half. People have no idea what they're even talking about. What they need to be doing <laughs> You don't start by explaining the technology and how exciting the technology is. You start by explaining how this helps you. Right. How does this make your life better? How does this make – and then later you can tell people about nodes and the blockchain. And you, if, if they want to know about that, that's fine. Like, for instance, I, don't, I have no idea how a car wash works, really. Like, I don't <laughs> actually know the principles behind it, but I don't need to. I just know that it's going to give me a clean car at the end. So if we had an engineer promoting – a car wash, he'd get no customers because he's focused <laughs> entirely on the technical aspects as opposed to what's the bird's eye picture of why this matters to me and why it matters to the world. And that to me has been the most frustrating part of Bitcoin because I'm very sympathetic to the project, but I always say, well, where can I send somebody to get a basic sense of what it is? And I almost never get a good answer to that. So let me ask yeah. you that question. Where would you send your grandmother, let's say, who wants to know more about Bitcoin? <laughs> so uh, funny story, I actually do interviews with my grandmother on my show. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Because <laughs> she's amazing. She's 93 and uh, she's just unstoppable. So I've interviewed her like I... so. Imagine having a granddaughter who's been involved in this thing called Bitcoin since 2013. And then every time, you know, she calls home, she tells you, 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 you wonder what she's doing over in America. And, and she says she's doing some Bitcoin thing. So she just started asking me about Bitcoin every time I'd, I'd, I'd call up. And I'd say, yeah, I just went to this Bitcoin conference and I did this interview with such and such who's you know, big in the Bitcoin space. And so she started to take note. And it then turn so that every time I'd call up, she'd be telling me about it because the press started to pick up on it and they started rep reporting the price movements all the time. So I'd call her up and she'd be like, oh, did you see the price today, Naomi? Oh, it's, re you know, it's uh, reaching 10,000 now. It's, it's quite, quite dramatic, you know, but I think it's going to crash soon because it's very volatile. <laughs> and then she'd be like, oh, and you know, the, the Chinese are really interested in it at the moment, but I don't know if the government will like that. And, and All right, hold on a minute, Naomi. Now we're cheating with your grandmother. <laughs> that's just cheating. 
I'm talking about the average grandmother, <laughs> not some super deluxe grandmother. Oh, I do have a super deluxe grandmother. No, she's she's sensational. But I've had many conversations with her. I think that you have to find people who, um, you know, a lot of people in the libertarian space, for example, who love the philosophical underpinnings on it are great speakers about this. And uh, I always send people to, you know, Jeffrey Tucker's a, a great talker about, about why it's important. Um, uh, Andreas Antonopoulos has always given some great uh, explanations. There, these days, there's so many YouTubers who just create easy to digest content about this space. Like I try to do that on my show as well, but other YouTubers like uh, Bitcoin Sessions uh, tries to do this and break things down. How do you create a paper wallet? What is a ledger? Uh, what is a trezor? Things like that. So um, there are lots of easy to, to digest things these days. Um, would I send my grandmother to them? But my grandmother, I create much more basic, <laughs> basic videos. But uh, but she's been she's been awesome. In, in keeping up with everything. And I um, I actually put together a, a children's book a few years ago called Billy's Bitcoin. So that's just a story to try and normalize Bitcoin. At the time, no one was using the word Bitcoin apart from in reference to drug dealers and money launderers and all the bad things that everyone hates. And, um, and so I was like, well, if we start to use Bitcoin... Uh, in a like an everyday sense, how could a could a child use Bitcoin? And you know, creating a children's book where Bitcoin was just you know a feature of it that that tries to normalize it, brings it into everyday vernacular. I think that was important. So I'm actually working on the second book of the series at the moment with Jason Chatfield, who's an amazing artist out of out of Australia who now lives in New York. And so uh, that should be that should be coming out soon. But definitely a lot of stuff out there if you do want a basic uh, understanding. But there's also a lot of jargon, <laughs> a lot of jargon and um, a lot of scammers as well. So you just got to be careful which information you pick up. Let me take just a minute to say a good word to all my crypto folks for a couple of listeners who have created a very, very helpful product called Bill Foddle. And of course, the word is a play on hodl. H-O-D-L, which is the word people use to say, hold on to your Bitcoin, don't sell it. Well, Billfoddle, which would otherwise be spelled billfold, securely backs up your private key or seed words or recovery phrase. This is important because most Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency is backed up on paper if it's backed up at all. So if there were a fire or a flood or your phone got thrown in the toilet, would your crypto be safe? Well, Bill Foddle is made of solid stainless steel, and it provides an easy way to protect your crypto from all those things and from being mistakenly discarded. This thing is weighty and will not get mistakenly thrown away like other methods. Ships with pre-engraved letter tiles, which you slide into the device to spell out your backup phrase or private key, ensuring user privacy. It's essential for anybody holding their Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies on a hardware wallet like a ledger, trezor, or keep key. And founders, Brian and Colin, are longtime fans of mine and of the Tom Woods Show, so let's support them. I've got a Bill Foddle, and you should get one too. In fact, you can get a discount if you go to billfoddle.com slash woods. That's B-I-L-L-F-O-D-L dot com slash woods. All right, let's get back to our conversation. You, at one time at least, became known as Bitcoin Girl, and I think you've <laughs> probably been trying to shed this moniker. Do you want to <laughs> tell the story of that and maybe exercise this demon once and for all? <laughs> yeah. So I, um, when I actually first started out, I brought it on myself. I was like, Bitcoin girl. Well, no one's taken that title yet, so I'll have it. So I, um, I, you know, it's my channel started out being called Bitcoin girl. And then I, I released a music video. I did a cover of Uptown Girl, which did really well. And uh, it was Bitcoin girl. And so then it just kind of stuck and it doesn't matter, matter where I go or, you know, if I'm doing an interview or whatever, everyone always brings it up. It's like, it's Bitcoin girl. So it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of stuck to me now. And uh, I try to try to maintain some modicum of, of credibility and be like, oh, well, you know, it's, the, it's Naomi Brockwell TV or it's the... Bitcoin blockchain and technologies of our future show or you know, something like that. And they're like, oh, it's Bitcoin girl. So it's, uh, it seems like it's, it's sticking around. Um, I don't mind it, although I do find it uh, terribly embarrassing at professional engagements uh, being introduced as that. <laughs> now, let's talk about, you see, again, there's just so much. This is like the Naomi Brockwell episode. It's just about different <laughs> things you're doing. 
I, I need you to say something about the music videos that you've become known for, because I believe that a couple of days after this the episode of this show comes out, you have yet another one being released. Yeah. So I um I my guilty pleasure is making really cheesy music videos, and actually I um so Stossel had me on and we played a part of my music video once, and his response his response once we played a clip was, "Aren't you embarrassed?" Like that. And uh, I, I had to respond and say, well, actually, it's not the cheesiest music video I've ever made. So it is a guilty pleasure of mine. I've done a, done a bunch of them. I have a J-pop video coming out in a few days. So uh, that should be interesting to see what happens there. Um, it's been a lot of fun to work on. And there are a lot of, you know, hidden Easter eggs throughout it of, of uh, memes in the space. So I, I hope people enjoy it. It's just a, just a lot of fun. And to keep the space light, you know, it, it can get really it can get really jargony as we said it can get really opaque it, um, there's a lot of government talk about the scammers and how they need to regulate and and I think we have to remember that this is also a, a really fun space as well with tech that's moving at lightning speed and it's really exciting place to be so I try to try to keep the excitement there and give people a little bit of <laughs> a little bit of fun through the videos now on Bitcoin let me play devil's advocate just for a minute what you'll read from critics are things like this. The price of Bitcoin is very volatile, and this makes it difficult to use as a medium of exchange. It has become, as its acceptance has grown, it has correspondingly become slower, clunkier, and more expensive. Because one of the selling points initially was it's almost costless to engage in transactions. And there are fixes supposedly coming in the pipeline, but you have people who are skeptical of the fixes. Then the fact that it's not anonymous. Some people thought that, oh, with Bitcoin, I can do whatever I want. Nobody can detect me. That's not quite so. So when we put all this together, plus we read occasional stories of, oh, people had some Bitcoin on that exchange and it totally went under and they're, you know, they're out of luck. Whereas at least with the U.S. government, I do have the FDIC. What is left for Bitcoin to make that attractive to me? Right. Um, so what you have to keep in mind is Bitcoin was the original blockchain. It invented this new technology, this ability to create a digital asset that can't be reproduced. So that's incredibly valuable, especially living in a digital age and also in an international marketplace these days. So much of what we buy is across borders. So it makes less and less sense to be using currencies that are very difficult to, to um, uh, cross borders with. So Bitcoin was the starting point and I love it. And there are, as you said, a lot of people working on different fixes. So we just uh, had the Lightning Network uh, be released and that's really exciting to see what's going on there. I actually have an interview with uh, with Elizabeth Stark, who's the CEO of Lightning Labs, coming out soon, explaining how that works and how that really does bring transaction fees right down and make things faster. But at the same time, you have other coins. So Bitcoin was invented and a bunch of other people came along and said, oh, well, we can definitely improve on this. So let's figure out out, you know, different ways that we can make changes to make this more useful for the consumer. I mean, that's something you don't see with government money. When you say you have FDIC insurance, it's like, great. So you've got a bunch of taxpayers covering the, the mistakes of, of banks who, who don't protect our privacy, you don't protect our money. In the private space, you have a bunch of innovators who are constantly saying, how can we make this better for the consumer? How can we create a better consumer experience? Um, and you just never see that in innovation with government monopolies on anything. Um, so for me, I love Bitcoin. I love, for example, Zcash, which is a privacy coin. Uh, Dash is also another privacy coin. Uh, Monero. There are lots of, it, depending on what you're after in your currency, there are lots of options out there and there are lots of places to exchange it. So you talk about volatility and yes, there is volatility, but there's also quite liquid exchanges out there where you can swap in and out of currencies. So it is is very easy to live entirely within the cryptocurrency space right now. Um, moving between coins if you need to for different different use cases. Um, you, know, you also talked about uh, exchanges, you know, they lose your money and all of this. I think that's great. You know, I think that if people started taking more responsibility for where they put 
their money, that's a much better solution than government coming along and saying, we're going to safeguard it and this is too big to fail and don't worry, whatever happens, we'll be there to get your back because that just encourages people to make dumb decisions. They don't do research. They, they're not accountable for their actions and uh, it's a moral hazard, right? So the, the banks can do what they want and they know that someone's got their back and they don't have to make good decisions, sound decisions with people's money. So um, now for people in the industry to know that they're held accountable if uh, uh, if they lose people's money or you're held accountable, if you put your money in a place you haven't done enough research on, uh, I think it gets back to a, it gets us closer to a market system than we've ever been before. And that excites me. Let me ask you about libertarianism because I've had several people as guests who have been from Australia. And what they've told me is, first of all, that libertarianism is not particularly widespread in Australia, not that it is anywhere, but particularly not there. They said that in general, their impression is that their fellow citizens tend to be more or less uh, middle of the road. They're, they're not really drawn to philosophies that, that swing in one extreme direction or the other. Mm -hmm. And so libertarianism is just not a natural fit. Now, first of all, is that – do you think that's true? And secondly, if it is true, then how did you get to be Naomi Brockwell? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, so regarding the extremes, I think you're right, and it may have something to do with our voting system. So voting is compulsory in Australia, which means that everyone has to go out and vote regardless. So you get a lot of politicians sort of appealing to that middle of the road area. They don't want to be too extreme. They kind of want to get as many people as possible. So they go right down the middle. In America, they've got to try and convince people to actually get out and vote. So you have people on far extremes vying for your attention, because otherwise, why are you going to vote? Other, right? You know, a lot of people are just going to stay home. So I think in America, um, the extremists tend to have more of a voice and, uh, and it's just leads to a, a, an interesting uh, evolution in the space. And in Australia, you know, it's funny, Jeffrey Tucker actually said one day, he's like, Naomi, if I were Australian, I don't think I'd be an anarchist. I think I'd just be an Australian. And it's like everyone there is, is quite, um, quite content with things. You know, the weather's pretty good. Uh, the money's pretty good. The government's pretty good. Um, from my perspective, we got a long way to go and there are lots of things to, to fix. But from a, an average Australian's perspective, they've got a pretty high quality of life. Um, and so it is an interesting phenomenon that it's there aren't that many libertarians there. I didn't know what a libertarian was until I moved to New York. Um, but there is like, for example, the Friedman Conference is uh, happening at the moment in Sydney. I went to the Friedman Conference last year. I was really, really um, grateful to be part of that. I, I got awarded a, a prize, which uh, was really I, unexpected and and very nice of them. And um, and what they've done at the Freedom Conference is awesome because I think it's like the largest liberty-oriented conference in the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, they're trying to get the word out that, no, we don't have to be complacent. We don't have to be content with how things are. We can always strive for more. You know, we are having an ever-increasing nanny state. Our economic freedom is going down according to um, a bunch of different indexes. So how do we how do we stay prosperous? How do we capitalize on the policies that got us to this uh, good standard of living in, in the first place and um, and do more of that rather than go in the opposite direction? So I love what the Freeman Conference is doing. Uh, my journey was interesting. Interesting. My, um, I, I, as I said, didn't know what a libertarian was till I till I got to New York, and uh, and I discovered I became friends with Gene Epstein, the economic editor of Barron's at the time. And he became my economics mentor and and started training me up. And I, he gave me a bunch of books to read. So I, I didn't know who Hayek was or Mises or Rothbard or uh, any of these uh, people. And so I just read a whole bunch of books and really got involved in, in economics. And it wasn't until um, years after that, I actually found out that my father was one of the people who started the first Libertarian Party in Australia. And I had no idea. I, he passed away when I was, was much younger. And I, um, I didn't actually know that. So Apparently, there was something in my blood that encouraged me to be interested in these ideas. And uh, it's just, yeah, just sort of built from there. So lucky to have awesome people around me in, in New York I've been able to learn from. What's the best website for people to go to to find out more about you? Because I see two major ones. Uh, I would say go to my YouTube channel. 
Um, so YouTube uh, slash Naomi Brockwell TV. And that's where I'm most active with my content. And Twitter is where I'm most active. So at Sky Corridors. And uh, in terms of websites, I um, once, <laughs> I'm, I'm like a one man show. So uh, it's, it's, Definitely hard for me to maintain multiple platforms. So I tend to be pretty lax about my website. But naomibrockwell.com is the correct website to go to to find out other information. And uh, and I try and update that as often as possible, although not nearly as much as my uh, my YouTube and my, my Twitter. All right. Well, I will link to all of those things that you just mentioned at tomwoods.com slash 1165 for this episode number. And that way, people who are interested in this just go there, and then you can, from there, easily get to Naomi's YouTube channel and all these other good things. Well, we are very much looking forward to welcoming you aboard the Contra Cruise this year Ooh, yes. in October. I can't wait. It is going to be, you can't possibly believe how much fun this thing is. And I know you think in the back of your mind, yeah, this will be a nice little time. It, it, it's so beyond awesome. <laughs> it's we, oh. Like Bob and I, the first time we did it, we were, it was about halfway through the week, and we were sitting down to prepare the next day, and and we said to each other, this may be – now, we've both written multiple books and done all these things. We, we, we both said, this may be the best thing we've ever done. <laughs> this beats <laughs> everything we've done up to now. It was so, so memorable. Well, I'm, and, I'm a huge fan of both of you, and I you. Um, always you – know, your show is amazing, and then Bob Murphy is just constantly keeping me laughing. So I can imagine that several oh, days on a cruise yeah. with both of you, my IQ is going to you know jump 100 points, and I won't stop laughing. So I'm very, very excited about that. Yeah, Bob is – so great because when we do, we do game show style games that are absolutely hysterical but what makes them you know 10 times better than they would be otherwise is that bob hosts them and he's so <laughs> funny he's so funny i remember there was the first year we were going to alternate i he would host part of it and then i would host the other part but he was so good i just thought bob you just run with this baby this is yours <laughs> you take it i'm not going to spoil this for you so anyway uh, i i um urge people to join all of us. Uh, Naomi will be there. Brett Vanat is coming. Of course, Bob and I will be there. And uh, it's going to be a, just a tremendous time. Do you know Tatiana Moroz? Yeah, and I love Tatiana. Beautiful, ah. beautiful uh, singer-songwriter. Good, good, good. Well, she's also coming. Uh, she's going to be her th third cruise. She does uh, music for us and enjoys it as much as anyone. So anyway, we're looking forward to that. Um, but tomwoods.com slash 1165 will have a smorgasbord of, of Naomi Brockwell links uh, for people to uh, have a look at. So continued good luck, and uh, I'll be seeing you soon. Wonderful. Thanks so much for having me. All right, everybody, that is going to do it for today. Make sure and sign up for my webinar with Matt McWilliams coming up June 7th. On that webinar, I'm going to be announcing the creation of my mastermind group for online business and affiliate marketing. We're going to work together, put our heads together, and help each other out and learn together and prosper together. And if you'd like entry into that, we're going to be talking about how you get in there, and you're going to learn a lot of great stuff on that thing. So make sure and sign up at tomwoods.com slash Matt, and I will see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>